Hi, my name is Tapasya Narang and I have with me Nidhi Zakaria, Ep and uh, Supriya Kaur Dhaliwal. This event is part of Kurt uh, Literary Festival and um, which is going to take place between 20th and 25th of April. We shall have a discussion with the poets um, whom I intend to now introduce. Nidhi uh, Zakaria is a poet, pacifist, and writer of fables. Her debut collections, Auguries of a Minor God, will be published by Faber in July 2021. Its first half explores love and the wounds it makes, journeying through the five arrows of calm, the Hindu god of desire and memory. The second is a long narrative poem, A is for Arabs, which follows a different kind of journey, offering an intimate account of migration and exile, of home and belonging. And Supriya Kaur Dhaliwal's poetry has appeared in Ambit, Banshee, Poetry Island Review, the Bombay Literary Magazine, and many other uh, journals. Her work is marked by its precise wit, its flamio's eye for the feel of a place, its complex emotional realities, and that shine a light on life as millennial under late capitalism. Her first book of poems, The Yak Dilemma, will be published by Makina Books later this year. She is the 2021 Charles Wallace India Trust Scholar Fellow at University of Kent, where she's working on a series of poems based on the life of Nora Richards. So um, we should start the discussion now. Um, I'd, um, I'd like to uh, ask our poets to tell us about the debut collections, uh, which have been recently published. Um, Nidhi, could you go first? Thank you, Vitapasya. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so my debut collection, August Seven Minor, is due out favor in July. I started writing these poems about two and a half years ago, um, soon after my mother died. So she died quite suddenly and she was still young. And this experience for me of, of losing um, an embodied sense of love, it took me back to the story of Kama, who's the Hindu god of love and desire and memory. And in one of the best known legends um, surrounding his life, Kama disturbs Shiva while he's in deep meditation and he's burned to ashes by the flames that erupt from Shiva's third eye and he then becomes um, Ananga which in Sanskrit means um, the bodiless one the one that doesn't have any limbs so I became really interested in in what happens to the experience of love when the body is um, lost either through death or, or transcendence or, or accident and the way that Kama um, sort of makes his targets fall in love is by deploying his weapons which are these arrows that are actually made of flowers and each arrow has a very specific effect on the body so um, but these effects they're not they're not really what we usually associate with you know the romantic ideal of love they they're more like they they wound the object of love leaving them sort of withered or, or paralyzed or, or destroyed. So I wanted to so explore that attachment, you know, that, that desire evokes both when it's tethered to a body, but also when it's sort of freed from that and, and the limitations of, of that body. That's brilliant. Um, it's it's a it's a brilliant concept to uh, deliver in uh, poetry, and I'd really really encourage our viewers to buy the collection as soon as it's out. And I intend to co uh, correct myself; it's not published yet, but it's been written and it's going to be out there very soon. And uh, I look forward to that. Um, Supriya, could you tell us about Yak Dilemma? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, when I started writing Yak Dilemma, the collection came together as a surprise to even myself. I was just, you know, over the last three to four years, I was just working on these different sort of poems. And um, like, as I was writing them after a few years, I I, I actually realized that the, they are all, it's like I'm trying to write one poem over and over again. 
And that is when I realized that like over the last few years, while all the time I was living in different cities and like trying to write in different sort of styles and like, you know, getting influenced by different sort of writers, uh, I was I was trying to write about home without calling home home. And I that was like sort of a latent theme that was coming across in all of my poems. And that is when I realized that this is this is like something bigger. All my obsessions are coming together in my poems together and this is the time when I should be when I should actually start out to put something together. And like all these years I've been obsessed with a few cities, I've been obsessed with love, I've been obsessed with borders, the concept of no man's land, I've been obsessed with homes, I've been obsessed with the homes of famous writers and, you know, the the idea of space in general, whether it's embodied in a room, a house, a city, and I wanted to explore that territory. And I think what, what was very important to me while writing Yak Dilemma was like, I wanted to write a book that I knew doesn't exist. And that was a challenge I set for myself that I really want to put something together that I really wanted to read myself. And that was a goal I set for myself and then sort of like, you know, filling in the gaps that existed with the work I had already written and I wanted to write further on. And then, yeah, it sort of like came together eventually. Well, that's that's uh, brilliant. The way you describe the journey of writing, I, I completely relate to that. Um, yeah, um, I, I uh, look forward to the book being out there in bookshops and encourage my our viewers to buy the book as well. And um, so um, I, I'll start with a few questions. Nidhi, um, I, I intend to ask that um, the first section of your book uh, very carefully archives sensory details while speaking of love. Could you tell us what is your motivation behind doing that? Mm, so, I think for me, everything begins with the body. You know, it's 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 the birth of of everything. It's sort of the first form, and and love for me is an experience of intimacy and intimacy means a space in which uh, the concept of two doesn't exist you know so what i try to do when i write is to create that space in which the separation you know between reader and, and writer between self and other between you and i dissolves even for a moment and in this, I'm very influenced by an old um, Sanskrit treatise called Natya Shastra. And the, so the fundamental concept um, that they elaborate on there is that the purpose of, of a work of art, whether it's a poem or a, or a painting or, or a dance, is, is not to entertain the audience, but it's to transport them to um, the state in which the creator was the creator of the work was when they were creating it in that moment um, and it's called sashide which means of the same heart literally um, so it situates you within the body of the other and that's what i was trying to do with these poems as well and and part of my work is um, really tied to reading the poems aloud because in in the simplest way they embody for me, you know, that kind of immediate invitation into intimacy when they're read aloud. Yes, I could sense that uh, poetry was very participative, uh, I, as in I, I could myself experience what you were experiencing. And that also reminded me of, of course, Nadia Shastra, but also um, Heidegger's becoming of truth within art. So I, I just loved loved the effect your art uh, created and I, I was so moved by it. I was constantly teary as well. So thanks for that. Um, Supriya, so um, my next question is for you. Your poems are amazingly palimpsestic and address questions of love, identity, language and several other things at the same time. 
Could you tell us what inspires your style? And if I could request you to read one of your poems, Migrant Words, um, that would be great too. Thank you. Um, uh, that's, that's really interesting that you put it like that, that, you know, my poems embody all those sorts of elements. But I feel like what inspires my style is, is, is not just like what, uh, what exists for us like in the real world but also like thinking latently always that how does it connect to us on different sorts of levels and like like the opening poem in the book meet me in the morning on no man's land it, i wrote it i wrote it thinking about so many things but when i actually wrote it 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 it, it reminded me of something Edward Said uh, says in his essay, The Mind of Winter, he, he really describes like the difficulty in describing the no man's land is that the nationalisms are about groups, whereas inside is about the absence of an organic group situated in a native place. And I feel like when I was, I was trying to find the voice for the book, I was trying to place these, these absences of, of different groups of different groups in different places and like trying to think how do I place them and even like the opening even like when I see like how I place my poem on the page I feel like if I was writing about no man's land I wanted that no man's land to exist on the page for the reader as a reader opened the book and started to read it so so I feel like like expressing all of that in written word is quite challenging anyway, but like trying to do it with with like different formatting settings and like different, by, by bringing in different voices from other writers and trying to sort of like fill in those gaps. Like I, there's a sequence in the book of, uh, which is loosely based on Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. And I feel like when I was thinking about cities in tangible manner, I was also thinking about the intangible cities, the kind of cities that Calvino creates, the kind of cities Marco Polo goes to. And I wanted all of that to speak with each other in the book. And um, and talking of my style, I feel like... Um, being a polyglot poet, languages are very important to me and how we approach languages is something always that I've thought about even before I started writing poems. Uh, yeah, so I feel like, I feel like I, I never, even, even, even thinking of my mother tongue Punjabi, I don't embody that language as my own. I think of every language, I approach every language as a foreign language, and when I when I do that, I really think, I, I really think about its implications in the manner that where where which language is rightly placed, who should be speaking it, why they should be speaking it, why they should not be speaking it. And all of those things, all of those anxieties around space, language, borders, they all come together in different poems in the book. And sometimes one poem speaks of all those things together, right? The, like the sequence, which is loosely based on Italo Calvino's poem, but sometimes it's like very well defined to one certain theme, like like the poem, Meet Me in the Morning on No Man's Land. And thinking of languages, I will, I will read the poem, Migrant Words. Um, Migrant Words is a poem by John Bircher, which I really like. And uh, a few years ago, I came across its Punjabi translation by Amarjit Chandan. And yeah, I feel like this, I wanted to write this poem in a certain manner that it gets well placed between Burge's version and Chandan's version. So I wanted to sort of like create a middle ground between those two poems, the original poem, it's Punjabi translation. And I like to think of this poem as a sort of a bridge between those two. Migrant words for Amarjit Chandan and John Berger. Somewhere I cannot now go, I buried some words from my dictionary of lament, a language I spoke long ago. I have a vain hope they will grow into a dialect of some hybrid descent, somewhere I cannot now go. Sihari, Bihari and other vowels will blow a cadence that my anglophone tongue could not invent, a language I spoke long ago. 
Chicken tikka masala did not originate in Glasgow. Someone told me this in my mother's accent, somewhere I cannot now go. When I'm asked about my pronunciation of th in Thames and Thug, I owe them the words that come to me in Punjabi to reinvent a language I spoke long ago. On seeing love being celebrated through every bay window, my eyes bleed counting the years I spent somewhere I cannot now go, speaking the language my mother's mother spoke long ago. Thanks for that, um, Supriya. It's beautiful uh, what you've written. Um, Nidhi, could I ask you to uh, read an extract from A for, A for Arabs? And my question is, A for Arabs speaks of experience of migration. The theme of exile also appears in some of your poems. Could you tell us more about how do you understand those issues? Sure. So, did I read first? Um, is for Arabs is a, is a long poem that forms the second half of my collection. And um, it chronicles the journey of uh, a family of refugees who have fled from a conflict in a, in a Middle Eastern country and, and have come to the West. And sort of their experience. So I'll just read you a little bit from the start. And the, uh, the poem is, it begins with an epigraph um, from quite an old record of um, one of the first sort of British chroniclers of, of the Arabs. In, and it talks about how the Arabs only, um, they wished each other joy on three occasions. One was the birth of boy. The second was um, the appearance of a poet. And the third was the falling of a, of a mare. So this is from the start of A is for Arabs. And they used not to wish each other joy, but for three things. The birth of a blessed baby blue boy. The falling of a beautiful broad boned mare. And the coming to light of a promising poet, conjuring his craft in the hallowed halls and courts of princely benefactors. Though these days, Arabs are more likely to be depicted as tyrants and terrorists, deprived of their dignity in demeaning strip searches, delineated as dogs, detained naked under black cloaks, blindfolds, draped over with dark hoods at Abu Ghraib, so eager to end their lives in the echo of jihad for the promise of enchanting, slim-hipped Huri in heaven, so that even the rest of us, who should know better, tend to believe extraordinary things about these people simply trying to exist in a hostile world. And wasn't it an Arab, Ibrahim, who famously extended his hospitality to the angels masquerading as messengers, who entered his tent unasked? And didn't he bathe their hands, their feet, encourage them to eat, offer those three strangers a bed for the night, fetch only the finest food that he could find, slaughter his fattest, plump, pinched calf just so his guests could feast on the tender roast flesh, feed their brown skin bellies full. But perhaps he understood what it felt like to be foreign, to be flung far from the familiar, to live in frequent fear for your life, for those you love to ferry five children across the fierce foaming sea, to find yourself having to choose between home and family, to flee like fugitives until you hit another fence, to face 
unflinchingly. The unassailable fact that from here on out so much will be forgotten. Language, flavor, fragrance. So fragile is freedom you fight for. So to your question, Devosia, I suppose as a migrant, um, the one is always interested in, in, in borders, you know. Um, and again, the, this poem is sort of a continuation of the journey of the, of the first half of the collection, and it takes its departure from the body, but the body this time is rather than the individual body, it's a, it's a political body or it's a politicized body, you know. Um, and I think borders, they have this strange dual function, you know, they, they keep things out, but they also keep things in, you know, so in that way, it's, it's a space where you're sort of constantly negotiating um, through different identities and, and borders, they allow for exchange, but it's, it's sort of a controlled exchange, you know, it's, it's, it's a transaction, which is sort of based on some agreement and for me the border is it's a place where you where you encounter the other you know and in this encounter there's the risk of of losing oneself and and that can be a dangerous place so again i wanted to look at what happens when we're faced with with someone or, or something who's radically different from ourselves you know can we only be hospitable towards those who are a mirror for us or, or can we truly welcome those who have not sacrificed aspects of themselves who won't upset our sort of fragile arrangements you know who don't challenge our inherited histories and so that's what i was trying to explore as well with this poem can we ever truly welcome someone who is sort of very dangerously other in a sense you know it's Brilliant how you mind um, your concern for politics and, you know, um, other bodies and politicized bodies with your own idiosyncratic style and given it a very, um, a very lived sense of, um, you've delineated it in a very um, lived sort of an experience which even the reader can experience. So that's brilliant. Thanks a lot for that. And I enjoyed the reading a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, and uh, we'll talk about that later. But I just admire the style. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, and um, my next question is for Supriya. Supriya, you give us a Flanios's vision when you navigate through various cities. However, it seems like you're not only looking at cities, but also their artists and artifacts. Could you tell us which writers inspire you the most and why? And uh, while we are at the subject of inspiration, I see that while evoking Shah in undesigning K25 horse cars, you also evoke Amrita Pritam. I wonder if Pritam's concerns in relation to the subcontinent's partition are still relevant for you as they are for me. That's a, that's a very striking question, and I have a lot to say on that. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with uh, um, reading the poem, perhaps, and designing K25 Hoskas. And just to give a little background, um, while, I was, while I was writing poems for this book, I was going through a phase where I was obsessed with the houses of writers. And um, uh, apparently, while trying to trace Amrita's house in Hoskas, New Delhi, um, I learned to my surprise that the house was demolished a few years ago. So there's nothing there. And uh, like, just like while writing this poem, I thought a lot about all the things that happened inside the four walls of the house, what all that happened under that roof. And just, I feel like I have, while writing poems for this book, 
all at, during the time I was obsessed with the right, houses of famous writers, I was sort of romanticizing them more than I should. I remember like, I remember when I was in Egypt, I was supposed to go to Alexandria with a bunch of poets to Kavafi's house. And apparently like that never happened, but I still think of that situation that it could have happened and now sitting in 2021 in my house in the middle of nowhere in the mountains i think oh once i was in egypt i could have gone to kawafi's house and i might never get the chance again and the whole and just the thought of this is just triggers so much in my mind because if, because because of this obsession with the houses of famous writers but also like like you asked me about about which are the writers that inspire me the most. But I feel like uh, I wanted to mention the names of two writers, uh, Natalia Ginsberg and Kieran Carson. But I feel like I am so closely attached to the writings of these two writers because their writings are so well connected to a place. And I feel like it, it, just, it just triggers my understanding of all the things that a place can be. These two writers help me understand it better. Natalia helps me navigate through Italy during during a particular time in history, unlike anyone else. And so does Kieran Carson with Belfast. And as you asked me, that is how do I think about partition? And I think about partition in a lot of ways. The way the ways it is connected with our communities, the way it is connected with so many people who are so close to us and thinking of its modern implications and all that. But I also think about, I also, from my understanding of the partition of Punjab, I think about the partition of so many other places, like, like thinking about the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Every time I'd been on a bus from Belfast to Dublin, I think I've thought about Umbrita Pritham and partition. And when, you know, when Brexit was happening and it was all over the news that, you know, now, you know, will, you know, the separation is going to be worse than ever. And there would be so many implications around it. I was constantly thinking of it in terms of the partition of Punjab more than anything else. Um, I'll read the poem now and then talk a bit more. I'm designing K25 horse cars for Amrita and Imbrose. The autocorrect tells me Varis is not spelt so. It must be war is. But that is what it has come to now. It is war in our homes, in your home too. Every inch of its walls bedecked in love and bulldozed dreams. The newspaper headlines in disguise. These walls were so thin that the entire world listened in awe to the many stories that were birthed here. Fazzles guzzles in the language of their Punjab. A Mushaira from his country, where, in retrospect, Wadi Shah lived, who could never speak from his grave in solidarity for this rubble. As the passers by on the street in horse cars continued to watch these semi treacherous activities in shame, they put off the thought of repainting the peeling paint in a hazel brew for the walls, just as you did. And I'm thinking that whenever I'm writing about these houses, I, how do I place myself there? That is a very important question for me always. And am I just like looking at the, them from the outside or I'm placing myself inside what's happening there or what could have happened there? And I, and I really enjoy playing with that, that tension that could exist. Thanks for that. Um, it's it's um, again uh, the idea of the palimpsest, how you connect the idea of home, belonging, and houses. That's brilliant. Um, very insightful. Um, and um, it's it's also interesting that you mentioned the partition of Ireland and partition of Pakistan at the same time. Um, that connection I have um, made a lot in my own research as well. And um, 
you're right like that that um, the events with brexit have again foregrounded and covid and again somewhat uh, you know um um reinforced borders has has uh, foregrounded uh, those those concerns for us so thanks for those uh, insights um nidhi could i request you to read your poem the unquiet amygdala and um, then i have a question uh, for you which is you constantly draw inspiration from non-anglophone sources did you find it hard to delineate those illusions in your English language works? Mm. Um, you all read the unquiet amygdala. Acute borderline personality disorder occurs when you've been abandoned neglected, abused, when you were a child and you are afraid, you think everyone is going to hurt you, everybody is going to leave, you know everybody always leaves in the end. It's an attachment pattern, learned behavior. Tests show that activity in the amygdala is heightened in people who are prone to this condition, to this conditional sort of love. Experiments indicate that when you start to walk slowly towards somebody who suffers. This person is more likely to stop, 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 stop you at a greater distance than the unafflicted because they tend to sense an increasingly credible threat. Borderline beautiful, my borderline brave, swaying silently, gyrating pain, and the riotous firing gyri of brain. Um, to your question about and non-anglophone sources so it's a very interesting question uh, for me and, and and maybe more so in this context where we are sort of three writers and and readers with roots in a, in a very specific sort of post-colonial literature and culture you know my um my parents were from different parts of india my mother's family is from the north from punjab and, and my father's from the south kerala so they didn't share a common um, Indian language. And, and having grown up overseas um, in the Middle East, mostly I, I went to English language schools. So my mother tongue is English, um, which is very interesting for me because the language that I call home is actually a foreign place. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a borrowed tongue. And after my mother died, I had this very strange experience where for the first time in my life, I, I lost the ability to to access English, you know, I, it was like the language just evaporated from my mouth. I, I, I would, I would reach for it, you know, as a way to, to express my grief and nothing would be there. And I felt almost as if I had lost two mothers at the same time, you know, I'd lost my biological mother, but I also lost my mother tongue. And it was in this state actually that I, I came across this essay by um, the French philosopher, um, Helen Sisu, and in it she said something that, you know, she articulated that experience so clearly for me. It was almost as if she she had whispered it directly in my ear, you know. And and she wrote, um, at a certain moment, 
for the person who has lost everything, whether that's a being or a country, language becomes the country. You know, one enters the country of words. And I feel like in that, in that state, I, I turn to sort of an almost a, a pre-learned language, you know, which for me emerges in, in mythology and folklore and these sort of collective stories that we turn to when we try to understand something that is incomprehensible in a way, you know. So when we go through an experience that is so um, overwhelming and, and large in our lives, um, I think the only thing that really makes sense is, is to go back to, you know, the earliest kind of interaction that you have with trying to make sense of, of the world that you're, you're in, you know, which happens when you're a child. So that was sort of a key for me to unlock these older um, stories from, from cultures, from, you know, the Persian culture, from, from ancient India, from, you know, um, Greek civilizations. Um, because myths are, they are universal, they, they draw on, you know, archetypes and the imagination um, that sort of surpass the, the particularities of, of a culture and, and, and speak more to the spirit that, that imbues that, that story. So, yeah, in, in many ways, I, I try to, um, I think like Supriya as well, challenge the, the dominance of the English language in literature and in poetry in particular, you know, I think that's really important and I'm really sort of very um, uplifted to see the, the change uh, <laughs> that's taking root. I think this is really important as well. Yeah, I admire the plurilinguality and especially how you did not, um, you used even different scripts in, um, in, in a way like uh, you did not switch everything to a uh, Roman script and, and retained the original. So yeah, I, I um, admired that. Thanks for that. Um, and um, that's, um, I, I, I look forward uh, to more such things and you know more um, more um, interactions between languages in terms of um, influences as well so you know we we can bring uh, to angled uh, what is still hidden in in other languages regional languages so thanks for that um, and um, so, uh, Supriya, could I uh, request you to read another poem of yours? And um, and then I have a question that you speak of no man's land and looking beyond one's skin color. So is there a message you have for your readers? Also, you talk about the inability to return to your mother tongue in migrant words. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um. I will read a slightly longer poem, and, which takes us to a different landscape, and then I will answer your questions. This poem uh, is called For Vincent Van Gogh from Kew Park Museum Line. I have tried to dream that the color of the moon is a cross between zinc yellow and chrome yellow, not just in Vincent Van Gogh's The Starry Night, but outside the realities of post-impressionism as well. However, I do not know how to make myself remember my dreams, to monitor the dose of yellow in them. During the summer of 2017, I lived in Bogorhut, Antwerp, in the same neighborhood as Vincent van Gogh, and waited for metaphors to shoehorn them into this poem. That summer, everything was yellowed with a tint of okra, a symptom of more general malaise. Several men were seen loafing about the streets to stuff their cigarette butts on bare shoulders. A man stood naked in his apartment window that overlooked mine and masturbated. Another naked man who considered himself dandy enough sat by his pungent yellow window in Sukhasan with his MacBook resting on his penis. Polaroid pictures were filtered with a fine sepia tone for archival purposes. 
Novels of average yet sad millennial romances were being read with great comfort while the passengers aboard the Charleroi airport coach cried the sight of garbage tourists who did not impress them with the foreign language skills. Every unfamiliar word pierced them like a bullet launched from a toy gun. A teenage boy holding a map anointed with notes asked me something in German that I could not comprehend. I assumed if he was in the hood, he must be looking for Van Gogh's room. There was nothing else worth designating on a map in this area. I fed him false information with my finger pointing back in the direction I had come from. Danke. My friend who kindly received me from the train station shushed me when I said it really looked like a melancholic Beckett novel. It was autumn by the time I found my way towards Museum Plain. What months do sun sunflowers die? September. Things were starting to die. Calling cards, lovers, lunch breaks, the ozone layer, sunflowers. The popsicle seller preferred not to make an appearance anymore. Outside Rick's museum, school children queued against their will. One of them called a bully a bully. Once when a child called the six-year-old me an ugly duckling, I did not call him a bully. I asked him if the duckling was yellow. They're, they're not the big things like the apocalypse, cancer, or snakes that intimidate me as much as having to answer back a bully. In the nearby Kew Park, I shielded myself against the rows of neatly parked cars holding an iris's postcard. On my return to the real world, autumn had brought rain for the yellow on the ground, yet no stars. Uh, I think I... I want to answer the second part of your question first, where you ask me about my inability to return to my mother tongue. And as I said before, I feel like I I approach every language as a foreign language. And I grew, I grew up in a Punjabi family, not in Punjab, in a neighboring state. So the language we spoke at home was not the language that was spoken in school or the language I spoke with my friends as a kid. But that was very much the language that, that was to shape a large part of my thinking. And Punjabi became a language for me that, that, we, that I only spoke at home. And at a very young age, I learned that, I learned how to make that switch very quickly. And, you know, while we were in school, when we were being taught other subjects like history, science, mathematics, anything that was being taught to us in English. And the language that people spoke in school was Hindi. And the language that the people in Palampur, where my parents live, spoke was Pahari. So I feel like I was at the cusp of four languages at the same time. And that really made me feel close to not to any of those languages um, but also at the same time from a very young age i think i i prepared myself to approach each language as a foreign language and nidhi said something very interesting that that it was almost like losing two mother tongues two mothers sorry when she lost her mother uh, thinking of it in the terms that you know the language that came with motherhood was also lost at the same time as a biological mother and this is something I've never spoken of before but while I was writing Yak Dilemma and till the point I finished it like I had my mother with me and by the time it's supposed to come out in the real world I don't have my mother with me anymore and the other day I was thinking that latently before my mother's death I wrote so many poems in which my mom just appeared without me trying to make a conscious e effort to bring my mother into my poem. And, and like all the newer things that I'm writing on, how differently it happens in those poems, because I feel like 
I feel like if I was talking to my mother in those poems in the Yak Dilemma, I feel like now my mother's voice is sort of guiding me in my poems. It's a very different thing from when I had my mother with me and the language that my mother brought with herself. I feel like the poems I was writing in the Yak Dilemma, the, my, my mother's language and my mother were walking with me during then. But how it is happening now is, is that my mother's language and my mother are guiding me. They're not walking with me anymore. And this is, this is a new transition for me as well. It's only been like, it's only, it's been less than six months since I've been, since I've lost my mother and since I've been experiencing all of this together. But it's a very different feeling. And, and like talking of no man's land as well, and like, you know, no man's land being the place where we lose our skin color, where where we where we just give away everything and and embrace a sort of acceptance that we we fail to do in real world. I feel like I feel like I don't have a message per se for the readers, but it's it's very much. But I feel like in my book and in that poem. Uh, meet me in the morning on no man's land i want to i want to create a frame for the readers through which they embrace openness a sort of openness which which welcomes us everything which is like where where we lose a skin color we could be you know we could you know there's there's like a phrase in meet me in the morning on no man's land uh, I could be lilac and you could be the shade of yellow you like. Everyone will qualify to be a person of color. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like all I want to create is a sort of frame for the readers through which they embrace a sort of openness where everyone qualifies to be a person of color. Thanks so much for that. It's it's um, really interesting to see how through art you've created uh, uh, the lost, you know, uh, the lost experiences. How how uh, through language and um, writing you've you've managed to uh, create that. Um, that that brings me to to the next thing I want to talk about, which is the pandemic. So um, it's it's also been uh, an experience where um, we we've, we've lost a lot. We've uh, all uh, lost our loved ones, and you know we've we've been um, and and the the, the stresses of not being able to travel, etc., which also we are living through art art and other things so um i i heard that both of you contributed to salvage press's um limited edition boxed anthology called plague poems so could i ask you about your experiences of living through the pandemic and how did you translate it into your works niti could you go first please sure so um Pandemic and, and I think the experience of lockdown, um, what it did for me was to reveal sort of our over reliance on language, you know, not not merely as a means of communication, but also as a way of uh, feeling feeling close to other people, you know. Uh, language for me is is it's a bit of a it's it's a little deception, you know. It's it's like an it's like an illusion that a, that a magician kind of conjures up. It says, you know, hey, look over here, and it distracts you with all these words. But but actually, what's important is happening somewhere else, you know. And so, I I became really interested in 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 the, in the edges of language in the in those places where language actually starts to break down, you know, where 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 it starts to rupture, um, and I. I think most of my writing, um, whatever has happened during the pandemic, has um, it's been a sort of strange, like almost a, a, a pre 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 verbal experience, closer to that to the animal side of us than the human side of us. You know, so um, working on a sequence of poems at the moment that that takes the mythology of legendary creatures like unicorns or or centaurs or these kind of half hybrid beasts you know and and 
and it tries to inhabit that state um drawing on on qualities like rhythm and and pace and and meter and sound rather than words and their meanings you know so that's been um it's been quite an interesting <laughs> for me as well i think experiment um and very different to um the poems in in the collection themselves um and i think what the what the play poems project did was was to open up that space for experimentation you know um to allow for that sort of full sensory experience of what a poem can be so that it's not just static on the page. Could you read for us Sleep Melancholy, please? Absolutely. So Sleep Melancholy is, is one of the poems from the, from the play poems project. Um, and it looks at, so, during lockdown uh, like many people my 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 sort of relationship to sleep changed you know and, and my, my patterns of sleeping changed and i became very interested in um the experience of sleep for people kind of over the over the ages and so there's a god in in um, greek mythology hypnos is the god of sleep and he has twin brother who's thanatos who's the god of death and both of these gods, um, they were considered um, wicked gods. And so they were exiled to a, um, a cave, a dark cave where, you know, no, no light or sound would ever reach them. Um, so I wanted to sort of invoke these, these, these two child gods and, and bring them back into a pantheon. And that's how uh, Sleep Melancholy emerged. To sleep melancholy. When it arrived, I could not sleep, turned his face so far from me, and I called out. I dreamed him there in a darkened cave by the river of forgetting. I begged. A calm and gentle God would find me, kiss my eyes, closed in enchantment, cover me with poppies. When it came, when it changed us and everything, we lost the hands of time and space, seemed elastic, shrinking into vastness. I thought of you then, how I would give half of my life for you, how you live when neither rays nor waves touch you, resting on blackened bark, a twilight in bloom, stitched together from the shadows on your wrists. But sleep, melancholy, you are not alone. For death is always somebody's brother. Constant youth with feather light fingers, waltzing on the seas, brought back. Oh, that's lovely. Thanks so much for that. Um, Supriya, could I also ask you to tell us how the pandemic influenced your writing and how uh, did it slow it down or did, did it help you bring new experiences into writing? I think when things started to take a wrong turn and we were locked inside our houses for the very first time, I, I I was very naive to think that this is something very short lived and this is just like a sort of a working holiday. We could do whatever we want and then like everything will be all right very soon and then you know we can get back to our lives. So during that very little time when I th when I approached the pandemic and the lockdown like that, it felt like an ideal setting. Like I am usually 
so usually like my normal working day looks like sitting out with my laptop at different places reading different books and just like and just like staying contained in a place um um but eventually like it it started but as things started to get worse it it really it really impacted how i approach certain subjects in my writing like before the pandemic i feel like whatever i was writing i was very much a part of it i was i was like it was it was sort of like i was standing in a playground and all the things i was writing about were like dancing around me but i feel like now during the pandemic and seeing how things are i am looking at all those things from a distance so they are all the things i'm conversing with while i'm writing about them are probably still playing in that playground but i am watching the i'm looking at that playground through somewhere else like i feel like i'm not a part of the things i'm writing about and like similarly for this jamie's project i i was writing about a sculpture and i was like when i when i wanted to write about it i just had like that sculpture in like six different cities open on my laptop screen and i was just like looking at them and trying to write about it and it felt absolutely absurd but it has it has like the pandemic has changed things a lot for us and uh, currently i'm working on a series of Nora richards poems as a charles Wallace india trust fellow which is also a sort of a remote residency so i am mostly sitting at the same place every day trying to think about Nora richards trying to think about ken trying to think about ireland at the same time and i'm just traveling in my head but like on the paper i don't know how it how it feels like i'm sure it feels very different from how travel feels like in the yak dilemma in like older poems and if it's okay can i can i read a poem from uh, the plague poem series very short one. sure it's called book talk the only one to come between Haruki Murakami and Iris Murdoch on the bookshelf was an awkward Ryu Murakami paperback. What do I say now about the panic in the bookstore over a misplaced Modcon biography? Are the chefs still taking regular cigarette breaks? In my dreams, I'm unable to differentiate panties from face masks. Both, I am told, are essential. While I know I could die today, I try to listen to one new song every day. I fail at this, I fail at that. I fail at giving that Ryu Murakami paperback some extra space, somewhere else, so that Haruki and Iris could live through this talk to each other. This can keep me up for days. It is because of me they are apart. Thanks for the beautiful poem. I, I really loved uh, your Nora Richards um, uh, poems. Um, I came across only one so far, but um, I look forward to the collection. Um, before we depart, I have uh, one last uh, question to ask. Um, um, I, I've heard about uh, diversifying Irish poetry nar uh, initiative in which both of you are involved. Um, could you tell us more about that project? And, um, as much as it's permissible at this, at this stage. Niti, um, could you go first? So Diversifying Irish Poetry is an um, initiative that is currently underway between uh, Catherine Gander, at, she's a professor at Maynooth University, um, who's taking the lead on the project along with um, the Ledbury Emerging Poetry Critics in the UK and Poetry Ireland. And it's basically one of the, the main aims is to look at um, diversifying um, the, the sort of critical review of, of poetry um, in Ireland. And so there will be a mentorship program for critics of colour similar to the, the one that Ledbury pioneered in the UK. Um, and Zubri and I are, are both sort of on the advisory board of that initiative. Um, and it's really, it's been really heartening, I think, to see the, you know, the sort of sea change that is happening across the, the, 
the literary industry and the recognition of you know the need for um not just writers of of color and writers from more diverse backgrounds but also readers of color and readers who have you know different um sort of social and cultural experiences that they're bringing with them to the reading because you know what you what you perceive in in a work um depends so much on on where you're sitting when you're looking at it you know and it's it's been really exciting for me to see even the lineup um at festivals like coach for example you know there's just so much um brilliant you know diversity that's being showcased and i feel like this is really a time when you know those old models of um sort of what what's been um, dominating the literary scene so far and you know the people who have been um given platforms and and um, sort of featured and profiled uh, starting to to shake up a little bit and we're seeing some some newer um you know strands of uh, thought on on contemporary issues that that affect um all of us in in a very sort of you know ever-changing sort of global landscape so yeah I'm, I'm very excited about that initiative and and a couple of other ones as well that are in the pipeline and um yeah excited to see what what comes of it so Freya, if you could tell us um, about uh, uh, how how you uh, also see um, this Irish poet, uh, diversifying Irish poetry initiative making a difference and if there's something else, um, some other project that you're involved in at the moment, if you could just briefly tell us about it. Uh, the diversifying Irish poetry project is very close to me because I approach it, I approach it, uh, I approach it as the version of me which came to Ireland for higher studies first and I the gaps I first observed that exist in the industry I very much through this project I look at the all those gaps through that angle and it's very heartening to see that something like this is being done because when I first came to Ireland for for my MPhil at Trinity I that's uh, so that uh, like the whole idea of diversifying irish poetry felt like a very far-fetched idea that was that was like way out of our reach and but, but and i've i've worked in publishing for a bit as well in between my two master's degrees in ireland and even then it felt like something like this would take so long to happen and it's very heartening to see that it is happening very quickly and from my own creative practice as well, I think what is integral to how I think, to how I approach certain things is how I bridge the gap between the canon and the contemporary without neglecting any of it. And how to attain that balance is always one of the biggest challenges I've set for myself. And I think diversifying Irish poetry is very much a project like that, where we need to attain that balance. With, uh, while we are mindful of all that comes in it like all all the older voices new voices the older communities the newer communities and yeah so to sort of attain that balance i feel like i really look forward to working further with this project and contributing more to it and uh, i mentioned this before but i mentioned it again that i'm very I'm very excited about the new poems I'm working on, which are loosely based on the life of Nora Richards. And this also, I think I wanted to work on this project ever since I came to Ireland, because Nora Richards is, uh, for those of the listeners who don't know, Nora Richards is an Irish theatre, was an Irish theatre practitioner who lived in who lived in North India in a village very close to my hometown and just created a sense of theatrical community there, which everyone was, which everyone was such an enthusiastic part of. But 
that I, when I came to Ireland and I mentioned Norwich's on so many occasions, who was also called the Lady Gregory of Punjab, which is a very big claim. And uh, no one actually knew who Norwich's was. And I was like, what? This is like the only, this is like one of the first Irish artists I ever came across in my life. How do people in Ireland not know about her at all? And there, there are many implications to her life, like how she came here, why she came here, what she did here, what she did in Ireland, and all of those things. So I'm sort of like trying to talk of her life by putting her in a contemporary setting. Like I, I want to talk of her going out for coffee with with one of her friends. I want to. Like, I want to talk of her, the theatre she created, and I want to talk of her going to a farmer's protest at Single Border. So, yeah, I want to think of all those things. I feel like I am learning a lot of what Nora was or Nora could have been while trying to create these different narratives. And I'm really grateful to the Charles Wallace Trust for supporting this research. And uh, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm um, aware that Charles Wallace Trust is a very, very prestigious award to hold. And um, I'm, I'm very um, happy for you and also proud in a way. I can't just express very easily how proud I am to find certain representation of people of color in um, in the art world, which, which inspires me also to go ahead and, you know, um, um, do something maybe um, not and um, I'm not sure if I'd be able to do something as great as the two of you but I'd try but I must say that I'm very very grateful to uh, have you both there and doing such brilliant work thanks so much for that thanks for joining us I want to tell our readers that you can buy our audience his books on uh, from the festival's dedicated booksellers uh, you can look for um, Charlie Burns's uh, Kurt collection. Um, please check out other events online on www.kurch.ie. Um, and if you enjoyed the event, please consider making a donation. For that, you can go to www.kurch.ie forward slash support hyphen US. So um, th thanks everyone for joining us.